All right, Ivan. Thank Hello. you. Welcome. Thank you. I, uh, I guess I am Mike. Great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> there are still people here. Um, thank you for, for sitting through so many presentations in a row today. I know even if they've all been interesting or useful, hopefully, uh, it's still a lot of talking to listen to in a row. So um, I, uh, rather than, as you may have noticed, I don't have a specific topic in the program listing uh, because I knew I was going last and I figured everybody else would probably say everything else before I got up here. Um, so I wanted to, uh, instead I was thinking, you know, it's, it's almost five o'clock, so what's, what's left to say at this point? Uh, I don't want to give you a whole lot of information that has to be thought super hard about, but I do, I think, want to, uh, I mean, we've talked all day about storytelling, so I thought maybe the, the easiest thing would be to just sort of tell you my own story and a few things that I've learned uh, kind of in the different phases of that. So I wanted to start by going back about 10 years um, to June, no, to May 2003. And I know, uh, you know, I was told a lot of the people who would be here today are students as well, so I thought it was fitting to start uh, 10 years ago with the day that I graduated from college or university uh, at New York University which was also the same day that I published um, an article on a site called Salon, which uh, is increasingly not even known in the United States, so I don't know if, if anyone here is familiar with it. Um, but at the time, what I was really interested in was this phenomenon happening in 2003 that was called the Year of the Matrix. Um, I mean, I, just, just as a check, how many people in here are familiar with and have seen the Matrix movies? Okay, reasonable. How many people haven't seen them but are aware of them? Okay, good. So wh what I found interesting in 2003, uh, as I was finishing school, was that you know, there was kind of this, this unprecedented experiment happening with what we'd end up calling transmedia, but we didn't really have, most of us didn't have a word for it at that point. And what was happening was that you know, there had been a very successful movie in 1999, and so in 2003, there were not one but two movies coming out. One was coming out uh, in May, and one was coming out in December, I believe. And that alone was pretty unusual, but even stranger was the fact that they had kind of all these other pieces coming out at the same time. So in the months leading up to the release of the second Matrix movie, they, the producers and directors of the movie gathered animation directors who were famous all over the world, uh, particularly Japanese anime directors, and they gave them the power to tell 10 or 15 extra stories that set up pieces of what was happening, that filled in the history that you had never seen in the first movie, it filled in things that happened between the first movie and the second movie, and that, that kind of added all these new pieces to it. At the same time, they got famous comic book writers and artists from all over the world to do the same thing, and they released two volumes of comic books that also added pieces to the story, so that there was kind of this one big thing happening. And at the time, the, the piece that I found most interesting was that they put out a video game uh, that came out the same day that the first movie, The Matrix 2, came out in theaters. And up until that point, most movie-based video games were basically just the movie, but you got to be the main character in the movie. Uh, and what The Matrix did that was really interesting that year was they told a separate story. So in the second movie, there's a character who's played by Jada Pinkett Smith, and she's in the first half hour of The Matrix 2. And then she gets sent off on a mission, and you don't see her again in the movies until The Matrix 3. What they did in the video game, rather than just telling the story of the movie, was follow her character from the time she left screen in the second movie until the time she came back onto screen in the third movie. And in the process, they ended up giving almost an extra hour of movie footage in the video game, which they had shot at the same time as the movie, which had been written by the writers of the movie. The actors actually said in an interview at one point that they didn't even know most of the time whether they were shooting a scene for the video game or the movie, which I thought was totally fascinating. Um, at the time, I didn't really know, you know, we didn't, I, I hadn't heard the word transmedia yet, so I didn't know what to call this. And so uh, when I wrote that article, I ended up calling it synergistic storytelling, this idea of all of these pieces that just sort of work together and help each other. But what I was really interested in when I wrote that article was this debate that was starting to play out in the news, which was, is the Matrix smart storytelling or is it just smart marketing? And I think that's a really interesting question that comes up with transmedia all the time. People always argue, well, 
it's not really a better story. You're just saying that now I have to pay for two movies, and I have to buy a video game, and I have to watch these animations, and I have to buy comic books, or I won't understand what's happening in the story. So there was this debate going on of whether The Matrix was a, an example of smart marketing or smart storytelling. And my thought on that question was that it was a dumb question. And the reason for that is that what I found really interesting about The Matrix was it was the, the beginning of people realizing that the difference just didn't make sense anymore. That when you have a movie, when you have a video game, when you have all these things working together to tell one story, everything is the product and everything is the marketing. You know, there was um, an interesting example that I read in grad school for the first Batman movie that Tim Burton did, um, where they added together all of the money that that movie made, you know, on TV, in theaters, on DVD, and then they added together all of the money that was made by the merchandise, the lunch boxes, the action figures, the comic books, everything that sold because the movie came out. And they found that about 90% of the money came not from the movie, which was the real story, but from everything else. So if you really wanted to say that you know, marketing and storytelling have to be different things, then you could argue that movies like Batman or The Matrix are nothing but two hour long advertisements for all of the products that they're selling. And that just doesn't make sense. What I thought was really interesting that came out of The Matrix as far back as 2003 was this idea that has been talked about some today, but that I, I kind of wanted to focus on as a theme throughout what I was going to talk about, which is that The Matrix wasn't really just a story. It was an experience that played out over the course of most of 2003. And that when you talk about transmedia storytelling, it's important to also think about experience design, about how you're creating and thinking about all of the different parts that someone's going to experience and how they add up to a whole that's greater than the sum of those parts. And without getting technical, uh, I sometimes find it's easiest to think of experience design by thinking of a nice dinner in a restaurant, which you know, at some point everyone's had. When, when I think about experience design, what I'm thinking about is the fact that it's not enough to just make sure that the meal is good. You've probably had good meals in terrible places. It's not enough to make sure that the silverware is really nice or that the table looks good or that you have a great view while you're eating. If the food is terrible, it's a bad meal. So when you think about experience design, or when I think about experience design, I kind of think of it as looking at all of the details, from the biggest ones down to the smallest ones, seeing how they all add up and making sure that what you're creating is an experience that's meaningful to somebody. So coming out of 2003, I was really focused on this idea that the Matrix was experimenting with this new kind of storytelling. And that led me to, I guess, what I'll call Act Two, uh, a couple years later, in the fall of 2005, when I started graduate school at MIT. And the reason I ended up going there was because there was a guy uh, on the, the right there, Henry Jenkins, who some of you may be familiar with. If you're not, the book that's on screen, Convergence Culture, is, uh, despite now being uh, several years old, a really good place to start if you're trying to understand um, on a global level, how media behavior has changed and how transmedia sort of started becoming more popular. Um, but Henry was running this program at MIT about media studies, and he had actually read the article two years earlier that I did uh, about The Matrix, and he was interested in all of the same questions that I was. So I thought that sounded like an excellent way to spend a few years, and I wanted to try and figure out in more depth what was happening and maybe figure out if there were new opportunities for storytelling or new opportunities for business. So MIT became the, the next place that I went. At the same time, the, the other thing that had really happened before I went back to graduate school was that television was becoming a lot more interesting. When I was younger, I had thought that movies were kind of way superior, much better than television. And then in the past kind of five or ten years, I had started thinking actually that all of the really interesting stories were starting to be told on television, where instead of telling a story in an hour or two hours, people were starting to tell these detailed, elaborate stories over the course of 10, 20, 50, 100 hours. Um, one of the shows that had first stuck with me for that is a show called Twin Peaks. How many people are, are familiar with Twin Peaks? Oh, thank you. <laughs> that makes me happy. Um, so that Twin Peaks came out in 1990. Um, and interestingly, because this wasn't as common back then, Twin Peaks actually had its own transmedia at the time. They published a series of books, a few of which actually hit um, the bestseller lists in, in the United States. Uh, which were different things mentioned on the show. So at one point on the show, one of the characters had a secret diary that you never got to see, but they ended up publishing a copy of the secret diary that you could read if you were interested in understanding more about what might have been in there. They published a travel guide to the town that had a real map of the fictional town and let you, you know, hear all of the different places you could go and what foods you could order at the diner, which, to be fair, doesn't sound that exciting, I know. But 
Twin Peaks was a really interesting example, and it was interesting partly because even though people loved it, it was a huge failure. In 1990, it got very little audience, even though everyone talked about it, and it was canceled after basically a season and a half. Um, so it was a cult favorite, but it was a commercial failure. The year before I went back to graduate school, though, another show had come on on the same network, on ABC, and that show was Lost. And I know Allison, uh, at the very least, talked about this earlier today. How many people have seen Lost? How many people hated Lost? I'm just curious. <laughs> Excellent. And how many people liked it? I guess everybody else, right? Um, so, the <laughs> so the year before I started grad school, Lost had started. And this was you know, before the show had what a lot of people would say is a pretty disappointing ending. I was still you know, young and naive at the time, but I, I thought it was a really compelling story. Um, and even more interesting, unlike Twin Peaks, it was a huge cultural phenomenon. It was the, in the United States, and in a lot of other countries, it was one of the most popular shows on television for a while. It was one of the most downloaded and pirated shows on the internet. Um, so a lot had changed in those 10 years, where you could go from a complex story being a huge turnoff that audiences didn't like to being something that audiences craved. What I also loved was that as I was going back into graduate school, Lost was providing an example of a transmedia storytelling experiment, really, is what I think it was, that was far more elaborate than what The Matrix had attempted. So you had six seasons of the show, but then you also uh, had a series of mobile webisodes or mobisodes or whatever stupid word you want to use for them. They were two-minute long videos that had actors from the show doing extra content. Um, those were fairly well received. What didn't go over as well were a series of novels that came out during the show's first season when they hadn't thought very carefully, and they ended up basically licensing out the novels. They didn't have the people who wrote the show or knew what was happening work on them. They basically had people who had watched the show. They gave them permission to tell new stories about new characters who weren't really in the TV show at all. And despite the fact that there are characters from the show on the covers of those books, those characters are barely in the books. They're about characters you don't know and don't care about, and those books were a huge failure. Now, a year or two later, Lost learned something pretty interesting from that failure, and they put out another attempt at a book called Bad Twin. Is anyone familiar with, uh, with this? I don't know how global this went. It was briefly a success in the United States. But what was really interesting about Bad Twin was that it wasn't a story about Lost. You know, the, the, the three novels that had failed were these stories about characters. So you were reading the book and you knew you were reading a story that took place in the world of Lost. Bad Twin was something different. What they did instead was they, before the book ever came out on shelves in stores, they had the characters on the show discover that one of the people on the plane, which had crashed in the first episode, had been carrying an unfinished manuscript for a novel that he was writing. So it's not about Lost at all, it's a novel written by a character who was going to be in Lost. And two days, so what you can see on the right there are two of the characters on the show very conspicuously reading it and saying to each other, hey, have you seen this novel that somebody has? This is pretty interesting. And like everything else with Lost, the producers implied that there were clues and that if you read it, you might have some new theory about what was happening on the show. So when the book came out in stores, it actually, at least briefly, went to fairly high on the New York Times bestseller list. People read it, and despite the fact that it ended up being a fairly terrible book, everybody wanted to read it because they thought there might be some important clue in it that they could talk about. So they definitely learned from, from that first failure. They also did um, a video game, which almost no one has played, so I won't even ask if any of you have played it, where, again, you don't play as one of the main characters on the show, you play as a nobody who's also on the island, and you run around and occasionally you meet one of the characters from the show. But they made a huge mistake, and they didn't get the actors from the show to actually participate in the video game, so the voices didn't even sound like the characters, and people immediately said, this is terrible, I wish you had never released this game. So uh, on an interactive level, Lost kind of got off to a bad start. But what I found really interesting, and there's a reason I was, was working up to this as one of the last things, was what Lost did online. Um, and a lot of this comes back to this idea of transmedia being used, in a lot of cases, for marketing purposes rather than as a product or as something you buy. So after the first season of the TV show, um, the first of a number of websites came online. And it wasn't an official Lost website. It didn't say Lost on it. It didn't say ABC on it. There was, in fact, unless you knew what you were looking at, there was no way to actually know what it was. But what it turned out to be was a, an official website for the fictional airline that had crashed on the show. And if you were to go to this website, you could hack 
into the files and you could look through the server and you could discover hidden information about the passengers who were on the flight. And the idea was just that it would give you enough new things that were mysterious and interesting that you'd keep talking all summer, and when the show came back in the fall, you'd still be interested. That ended up being a very effective strategy for Lost. The show's second season opened far bigger than the first, and they, throughout the next five seasons of the show, they came back to this strategy over and over. So there were mysterious organizations like the Hanzo Foundation introduced on the show. Almost immediately, the Hanzo Foundation had a website. The Dharma Initiative had a website. I'm not going to geek out and name all of this Lost stuff, but you get the idea. There were all of these fake websites that pretended to be real things that had nothing to do with Lost, so that you could kind of enter into the world of the show online and get more stuff to talk about. And then finally, there was one more really interesting thing that Lost did that even now most shows haven't learned from or imitated, I think because it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And that was that Lost had a message board called the Fuselage. And the most interesting thing about the Fuselage was that it wasn't owned by ABC. It was a fan site where you could go to talk about the show. But the money for that site had been put up by J.J. Abrams, who was the creator, one of the creators of Lost. And the site was interesting because almost every member of the cast and some of the members of the crew of the show and J.J. Abrams and Damon Lindelof and all of the people who worked on the show would actually come to this message board after almost every episode of the show and they would talk to fans. They would answer questions, they would offer their own you know, hints and clues about what people should be looking for. And they built this very unusual direct relationship where a huge number of fans of Lost felt that they knew and were in some way friends with the creative team behind the show. So I found that incredibly fascinating. So when I got to MIT, I knew that I wanted to focus on transmedia, and Lost seemed like a very logical place to start. But while I focused on Lost, I also wanted to look uh, at a show that seemed to be less successful but also had an intense fandom, and that show, uh, which fewer people have probably heard of, was called Veronica Mars. Is anyone in the room familiar with? Yeah, like 10 people, cool, excellent. That was basically what was happening in the United States, too. It was not a very successful show, but the people who knew it absolutely loved it. And what was interesting to me about Veronica Mars was that it had a fan base almost as, as energetic and excited as Lost, but it did almost nothing to interact with them. It had, you know, there was no transmedia. There was nothing online you could look at. So I looked at those two shows while I was at MIT, and then importantly for me, I also uh, ended up being a member of a research group that started, which was called C3. Those are three Cs on the screen, um, and stood for the Convergence Culture Consortium, which was looking into ideas like transmedia and the new relationship that audiences had with creators and with advertising. Um, but it was funded, and this is unusual for an academic organization, uh, at least for, for MIT, it was funded by commercial groups. So our research partners were MTV and Yahoo and Turner Broadcasting and an ad agency called gsd &M and Fidelity, which is an investment company. Um, and I mention that only because even though I sort of thought I was headed for uh, a career focused on entertainment and these new models of entertainment, I started thinking fairly early in the process about where brands fit into that. So I know uh, a lot of the presentations throughout today have talked kind of at a high level about you know, how transmedia works and some different case studies. I wanted to share three, I think, interesting, specific examples of things that I found in my research while I was at MIT that drew on other stuff that I've, that I've already talked about. So to go back to The Matrix for a second, you know, I had mentioned that there were a series of animated shorts, short movies that came on, you know, two-minute movies that came out before the second movie came out. And one of those, I think, demonstrated really effectively just where transmedia could go wrong and be a terrible thing. And this is still a useful thing to know. So there was one of the, the ten stories that they put on, uh, on the internet before the movie came out was called Kid's Story. And uh, that's the, the character on the left there is just named Kid. And again, for those of you, I apologize if you're not familiar with The Matrix, for those of you who are, essentially what happened in this story is just that Neo, Keanu Reeves' character, met a new kid and introduced him to The Matrix. He told him what had happened, he brought him out of it, and he saved him. When the second movie came out, they decided that they were really going to honor the fact that that had happened and treat it like it was an important piece of story that you should already know about. So that shot on the right is the kid when he showed up on screen in the movie. But they never introduced him, and they never explained in the movie who he was or what he was doing there. He just sort of showed up and started talking as if you would already know who he was. And the reaction online from a ton of people was, this is really stupid. Who the hell is this character, and why do I care about them? And so what I would take away from that is you know, one of the challenges of transmedia is that it's really difficult to make assumptions about how your audience is going to engage. 
you can make 10, 15 different pieces of story, but you can't assume in any one piece of story that people have already seen the others. You can't assume that they know a character in your movie just because that character has been introduced in a comic book. So that was, that was one place that they, kind of an early failure in transmedia to learn from. A second deals with Lost. And again, if you watched Lost even for the first season or two, then you're probably familiar with these numbers, which were given kind of this apocalyptic, mysterious importance on the show, where they kept showing up all over the place and characters kept wondering what they meant and why they existed and what their mystical power was. So interestingly, the creators of Lost decided they were going to give an answer to that question, which, you know, famously they don't give answers to most of the questions they ask. But the way that they did it was at the end of a summer-long interactive experience where you would only find out what the numbers meant if you spent two months visiting a dozen different websites and visiting places in the real world that they sent you to with GPS coordinates and collecting different clues online and trading them with other people who collected clues. It was a tremendous amount of work all for this payoff that was fairly important to a lot of people who watched the show. And so there were a tremendous number of people who didn't want to do any of this transmedia stuff. They just wanted to watch the show and they expected that if the show asked a question, it would answer that question and wouldn't require them to do more work. And I remember I was interviewing people that year who were working on all these different transmedia pieces and I talked to one of the writers of Lost who was also writing this online experience that summer. And even though he was the one who was designing this entire experience, he was actually really concerned about it because he hated the idea that people had to do extra work just to understand what was going on on television. He actually, one of the things he said to me when we were talking was, it's a really disturbing trend. I mean, in 10 years, am I going to have to do homework before I can turn on television? And that's, you know, obviously a problem as well. So if we were going to take a second lesson from, from that failure and from how angry fans got, it would be that to be effective, transmedia kind of has to be, uh, this is a terrible word to have used, I guess, atomic. It has to be able to work entirely by itself and stand alone, but it has to also make everything else better through connection. It has to be additive. The most important thing, though, being that you can't require people to follow along with it. And then the third example, which I haven't uh, talked as much about yet, but I'm, I'm working my way up to, is with Star Wars. So, uh, I mean, this is a dumb question, but who's a Star Wars fan in the room? That's less than usual. Fantastic. Um, so Star Wars has been, a, a, has been a pretty interesting one, and I mean, at MIT this was definitely one of the things I studied, because Star Wars is seen for a lot of people as kind of the birth example, or the first place that really figured out transmedia and got it right. You know, you had three movies uh, now almost 30 years ago, and then there was this kind of silent spell where there were no movies for about 15 or 20 years, and during that time what happened instead was that they started to tell new Star Wars stories in all of these other places. There were novels, there were comic books, there were short stories, there were video games, and all of them were supposed to be interesting because they told you more things about the characters that you had seen in the movie, or they filled in history. So in theory, that sounds a lot like transmedia as, as we've been talking about it today and, and as it works in general. I mean, there were more, as it says up there, there were more than 750 books. You know, I, we have, um, as, I'll, as I'll get to in a moment, I ended up working at Lucasfilm, and there's someone there whose job is basically just, this is an amazing job, by the way, there's someone whose job is just to know everything about Star Wars. And so he, he keeps a database that just has every character, every planet, every weapon, every ship, everything there is to know about this fictional universe. And, you know, he has read all of these novels. A lot of people read all of these novels. A tremendous number of them actually ended up being best-selling books and made a ton of money. Now, the weird thing about that is that George Lucas, who obviously created Star Wars, didn't really care about any of them. To George Lucas, and this is you know, not a secret, he's actually said this publicly before, they were basically another way of making money. You know, he saw very quickly after Star Wars that he could sell action figures and he could sell lunchboxes, and he thought, well, we might as well sell books and comic books too. But he didn't get involved in those. He didn't tell stories. He didn't look at the details very often and say, yeah, that's definitely what happened there, or yeah, that explanation is consistent with everything else that I've thought of for this universe. And that turned into a real problem. You know, as, as Jeff and a few other people talked about earlier today, effective transmedia design really benefits from having one or very few visionaries or people who understand the entire idea of what you're going for and can make sure that everything works together and is consistent. George didn't really care about whether the novels were consistent. He just thought they were a way to make money because he had 
at the time, he wasn't sure he was ever going to go back and make any more movies and make any more television show. The problem, of course, is that eventually we did make three more movies. Uh, we did end up making three more movies, um, which I'll just go on record and say we're not as good as the first three. Um, but in order to make those movies, and then the television show The Clone Wars, which came after that, George basically had to throw out everything that happened in those 750 books. If there was a detail he didn't like or he wanted to tell a different story, he just pretended none of it ever happened. And with him, that was fine, because they weren't important stories. They weren't uh, what, you know, what we call canonical stories. But to the people who had spent thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours reading all of those stories, that was incredibly insulting. So it ended up being a small, you know, relatively acceptable part of the Star Wars fans, but they were not happy. And so part of you know, the, the third lesson to take away there is it's incredibly dangerous to contradict yourself or to not plan ahead when you're making transmedia, because if you back yourself into a corner and then just ignore everything you've done before, it's kind of, to, to just bring this full circle and use a dumb metaphor, it's kind of like seeing a glitch in the matrix. You know, you realize that these things that are supposed to add up don't add up, and all of a sudden the world doesn't seem very real, and if it doesn't seem very real, it doesn't seem like it's a place worth spending a lot of your time. So, from that, hmm. I wanted to share uh, two important things that kind of happened as I was finishing up at MIT because they lead to kind of the next part of my story. One was that in looking at Veronica Mars, the TV show that I mentioned, that was not doing a lot to engage with its fans, I ended up spending one of my summers, uh, I got lucky and met someone on the show who interacted with a lot of fans because I was also interviewing fans a lot of the time. Um, and I got to spend about a month on the set working as a member of the crew and working on the third season of the TV show and helping kind of everything from graphic design to camera positioning to set decoration. But I also got to meet most of the creative team and a lot of the members of the cast and the people who made the show, which all these people were deeply passionate about, which was a really interesting balance to spending all of this time that I'd spent during the previous year talking to the fans and these people who had never met the cast, had never met the crew, but cared about it really deeply. So that was one thing, kind of a, I'll come back to uh, near the end, but an early connection with Veronica Mars ended up being pretty important to what I've done since then. And then the second piece was that, you know, I had, I'd shown this website earlier. This was the official website for the fake airline in Lost. Um, as part of my research on transmedia, I was going around and interviewing as many people as I could who made all of the different parts of Lost's transmedia. And when I did, researching this piece led me to uh, an advertising agency in Brooklyn, New York called Big Spaceship that specialized in a little bit in transmedia, but mostly in kind of entertainment and movie and television advertising. So as I finished up graduate school and finished my work on Lost, um, there was actually this nice moment where I had no idea what I was going to do for a job. So if you're interested in transmedia and you're just finishing up school now and you're not sure what you're going to do with your life next, welcome to the club. That means that you're probably going to have a good career in transmedia. Um, but for me, spending all of that time at that ad agency asking them questions about what they had worked on led to them asking if I wanted to basically come do that it was actually the best question anyone's maybe ever asked me. They said, those were some good questions you asked us. Would you like to ask those questions for money instead of a grade? And that sounded pretty good to me. So in fall of 2007, I ended up shifting and becoming a strategist at this agency called Big Spaceship, which specialized in kind of creating digital and online engagement programs for brands and especially for entertainment brands. And it was funny because when I went there, I told them that I was only going to be there for a year. Uh, and then I was going to go out to Los Angeles and I was going to work in entertainment and work on something like The Matrix or something like Lost because I thought that was what I really wanted. Except when I got there and started working with all of the clients at the ad agency, I found out that I really enjoyed it. Um, so if you're interested in transmedia and you're not sure what to do next, I will say that advertising agencies are a tremendously good place to at least consider as a next step for yourself. I mean, what, what I enjoyed about being there was that there were kind of a million different kinds of challenges in an ad agency and I got to do a million different kinds of things. Um, I'll tell you quickly, there was, there was one month that sort of summarizes what it was like to work in advertising, for me at least, where I spent the first week of the month uh, trying to understand how women over the age of 40 think about their butts and how that influences what kinds of jeans they buy. I spent the second week of the month trying to figure out why people hate working out and going to the gym. I spent the third week of the month trying to figure out why eight-year-old girls tell stories when they're playing with dolls and what kinds of stories they tell. 
And then this was the real uh, mind blower for me. I spent the fourth week of the month writing riddles in ancient Mayan hieroglyphics because we were writing a transmedia story about the end of the world. So in a lot of ways, that was the perfect job. I have a very short attention span, as you might be able to tell from the lack of kind of one topic in this presentation. And being in an ad agency lets you do that. You kind of, it becomes a strength to be interested in 100 different things at once. So like each of the other phases that I'm talking through, I wanted to share a few useful things that, at least for me, that I took away from the time that I spent there. The first of those things that you learn when you're working in interactive, and this is, I think, very different. You know, working for the internet or for video games is very different from working in traditional film and television, because from the very beginning, you know that you don't have full control, that you're giving your audience or your player or your user or whatever you want to call them some of the control. So you can't just do storytelling. You actually have to think about how you're designing an experience that someone's going to take part in. And even if you choose to not think about it that way, you're still designing an experience. You're just designing a bad one. The second lesson, you know, coming out of, of MIT and being really excited about transmedia, which hopefully some of you, you know, were before today and hopefully more of you are now, I was so caught up in this idea that transmedia was cool. I mean, I, like most of the speakers today, I think I'm kind of a nerd. I love detailed stories. I love video games. I love these long, elaborate um, mysteries. And so I thought, well, this is amazing. This is definitely the future of storytelling. Why wouldn't everyone do this? And when I got to an ad agency, I learned the answer to that question, which is because it costs money to do cool stuff. Uh, and if it's not going to make that money back, then no matter how cool it is, it's not really worth someone's time to invest in doing it. So a big part of what I learned, I think, in, in advertising is that, you know, and so I guess this is advice for anyone who's coming out of an academic setting now, a lot of things sound great in theory. I mean, a lot of the other speakers who have gone today have talked about process and methods you can use and ways to kind of deconstruct and plan transmedia. And I have incredible respect for all of those speakers because they are far better than I am at seeing a process and being able to use that. For me, I pretty much always feel like I'm making things up from scratch every time I start over. And the biggest thing I learned in the ad world is that things that sound really good in theory, things that made perfect sense in school, don't work at all sometimes when you get into the real world, and then you just have to be prepared to adjust and adapt. So that was the second thing. The third thing kind of came out of this challenge, and uh, I'm looking at Ian because I met him uh, about five years ago, and it was for a presentation that I did for Ian that I started thinking about this problem, which was you know, a fair number of marketers and advertisers are interested in the idea of storytelling. I think most advertisers more and more now would say, oh, I'm an advertiser, that means I tell stories. But if you go back to that question that I talked about at the beginning about whether something like The Matrix and whether transmedia storytelling is a form of marketing or a form of storytelling, you run into this problem, which is that a lot of storytellers, the people who create shows like Lost or create movies like The Matrix or like any other you know, action or adventure or mystery franchise, a lot of them aren't interested in marketing. They think it's kind of beneath them and it's not worth their time and that's for someone else to do. And if they think the transmedia is just marketing, then they don't really involve themselves with it. So I learned kind of the hard way when I was at the agency just how badly things can end up if you're trying to build transmedia around someone else's story but can't even talk to them about what story they're trying to tell. So two quick, fun stories about that, and hopefully they're fun for you because they were, at the time, incredibly embarrassing for me. Um, the first of those goes back to that website that Big Spaceship made for Lost which you know, I think I had already said, the idea was that the audience for Lost loved clues and they loved debating with each other and they loved trying to discuss what everything meant. So the only assignment that the ad agency got was give them a bunch of clues to keep them involved over the summer and give them stuff to talk about. And so of course the first question you ask when you get that instruction is, okay, well what's gonna happen on the show? Because if we're gonna make up clues, they have to be clues that lead to something, right? And they said, no, not at all, don't worry about it. So we spent, or the agency spent the better part of a summer making up clues for people to debate and analyze and study that didn't mean anything. And that certainly wasn't you know, the preference, but they had to be meaningless because we had no idea where the story was going. And in the course of doing that, something really strange happened. And this goes back to the idea that everything is experience design, even when you don't intend for it to be. So I was working, as I said, at an agency called Big Spaceship. And I don't know, how many of you have ever worked with code or with programming and, and made something? Websites or, okay. So for the rest of you, obviously, any website that you have is made out of code and coders often 
Writing code is a very specific type of skill, and it doesn't always involve thinking very far ahead. Uh, and so as our agency was creating this website and a bunch of others, in the code, they would sometimes mention the name Big Spaceship because it was the name of our agency, and we were using a computer that was called Big Spaceship to test the website. And the problem with that is that the fans cared so much about looking for clues that they immediately downloaded everything and started ripping the code apart and looking at the code as if that was meant to be a clue as well. And so before the end of that summer, people became convinced that Big Spaceship was not an agency, but a clue about what Lost was really going to be about, that the island was going to turn out to be an alien spaceship. Which got even better when another fan who had nothing to do with us and nothing to do with the show bought the website name BigSpaceship1.com and started putting fake clues on it that they were making up because they really enjoyed the fact that nobody knew that they were any less official than anything that ABC was doing, at which point the most popular theory was that the entire thing was a spaceship. And all of that happened because we didn't take one word out of our code. That was kind of dangerous on our part. The amazing thing about how that story ends is that when we stepped forward and we told people, this isn't actually part of the show, that's a mistake, we're an advertising agency and, and we, we just left our name in there. They didn't say, oh, that makes sense. They said, how do we know you're a real advertising agency? So that was great. The second thing, and this one embarrasses me a little bit more, how many people are fans of Breaking Bad? Which, which I'll just say, because I have a microphone on, uh, that I think is the best television show on right now. Um, so one of the projects that at the time I was not that excited by was that we got invited to help launch the TV show Breaking Bad, which at the time, you know, we got to see the first episode, and we got to read scripts for two or three more episodes. But we never got to talk to anybody. We didn't talk to Vince Gilligan, who Allison talked about. We didn't talk to anyone who worked on the show. We talked to the network's marketing department. And so we didn't really know what the show was going to be about. If you look at these photos, which were kind of what we had to work with, we thought the show was going to be about a guy who was having a terrible midlife crisis and had to go work at a car wash where his students would come make fun of him and he would have no self-esteem and that would be the price of being able to support his family. That was what we thought the show was going to be about. So what did we go back and propose to them as an idea that, thank God, they did not take? We said that there should be a game where you basically wash cars while your students make fun of you. And our idea was that the whole game would be about finding the right balance between having no self-respect and having enough money to keep your family alive until eventually you just go nuts and start selling meth. I'm just going to say this, because it was, this was my idea. It was an incredibly bad idea. And the only reason we had this idea is because we had no access to the creative team. We had to make our own stupid guess about what we thought the story was going to be about. And thank God AMC knew that that wasn't where the show was going because it would have ended really badly. So those are probably longer stories than I needed to tell you to drive home this point. But the point for me is that if you want to make really great transmedia, you need to have real interaction with the creative team that's making everything, with the people who are in charge of a movie or the people in charge of a television show. They have to at least be aware of what's happening, and they have to actually care and not just see it as marketing that should happen on someone else's time and with someone else's work. So that, in turn, led to kind of, that was a huge factor in, in the next to last step so far in my career, which was that uh, in the spring of 2010, one of Big Spaceship's new projects was that we got approached by Lucasfilm to redesign the website for Star Wars. Uh, and we spent, you know, for anyone who works in advertising, you'll understand this is a very long time. We spent five to six months just proposing a new plan for the website, which is, I mean, usually you should take maybe two to three weeks. So five to six months was an incredibly long time. We worked with their team. But as we came out of that, again, this, this idea of experience design being the thing that really matters was sort of what was on our mind. And so we told them, and this is a dangerous thing to tell someone who's asking you to do something for them, we told them that what they were asking us to do was kind of stupid, that they didn't need a better StarWars.com. They needed to think about the entire experience people were having with Star Wars everywhere. And so we said that they needed to focus on something that looked more like that, where the big red circle is StarWars.com, and then there are a dozen other sites, and there's every social media channel, and there's anywhere that people were already going to talk about Star Wars, whether Lucasfilm was involved or not, we said they needed to think about all of that stuff. Now, to their credit, they completely agreed with that. And they ended up hiring Big Spaceship to redesign the site and to work with them on that overall strategy. But they also, and this goes back to my point about how you can't really do certain things without having access to the creative team, they knew that it required a lot of change, and they didn't know how to make that change themselves, 
So after some extended conversations with them, I ended up moving from New York to San Francisco to take over all of the digital media for Star Wars and for Lucasfilm, which comes to Act 4 in January 2011, which was uh, my shift from academia through advertising and into entertainment. So obviously there were, there were two reasons I really wanted to work at Lucasfilm and, and to take that job, which meant kind of leaving my family and a whole lot of friends and moving to the other side of the country. The first was that Star Wars is basically the biggest, nerdiest, awesomest fan brand that's probably ever been created. It's the biggest story world. It's got more characters. People care more about it. I mean, as maybe you've heard this, in the uh, United Kingdom, they had a census a few years ago where you could write in what religion you were if they didn't offer your choice. And Jedi was the ninth most popular religion in, in the UK. That's an incredible level of passion. So to be able to work on something that means that much to people was really exciting. And then the second point, obviously, was that inside the company, I would have access to the creative teams. I'd be able to work with the people writing and creating the animated television series. If we ever, God forbid, did another movie, I'd be able to work on that. I'd be able to help make sure that the games we created all tied together and meant something. That was this vision that I had. So what did I learn while I was at Lucasfilm? Because I know at this point, this has probably been a long day, and I'm going to try and wrap this up for you. What I learned is that at Lucasfilm, you're not allowed to talk about anything you learn at Lucasfilm. So that's pretty much all I can tell you. In all seriousness, I, I did have to sign a contract that said I can't talk about much of what I experienced at the company, but I also, having only been out of Lucasfilm for about four or five months, am still trying to figure out what it is that I learned there. Um, I will tell you one thing that I got to observe firsthand, because this isn't really specific to Lucasfilm, it was just something that I learned, happened to learn there. When you have to teach talented teams of people to work together, on a big picture, which is what transmedia is. It's about the big picture of how everything fits together. That's incredibly challenging to do. It's actually much easier, I think, to start doing transmedia with people who have never made video games, who have never made television, who have never made film, because if they haven't, they don't already have this idea of how everything's supposed to be done. It's really easy when you're trying to bring together a company that can do all of these things, that can make video games and movies and television, to run into this problem where everybody's really busy and everybody's already short on time and trying to meet the deadlines for their own project. And so anytime you want to do something that connects those projects and makes them more complicated, the answer is always going to be, that's not my problem. You figure it out by yourself. And you know, Lucasfilm was not by any means the worst example of that that I've seen, but it was definitely difficult. And so transmedia sounds, you know, I think this is something Jeff talked about as well, it sounds a lot easier than it is. It takes a tremendous amount of organizational effort and planning if you want to do it on a, on a really big scale. Um, and to paraphrase uh, one of the few lines that I do like still from Lost, the way that I sort of ended up concluding this was we either learn to work together or we tell mediocre stories alone. Um, now, the reason I mention all of that now is because for what it's worth, and this is just my opinion, I think everybody attending this conference has a really unique opportunity. You know, having seen the other programs, that there's a video game track here with amazing speakers, that there's an audio track, that there's an animation track. This conference alone gives everybody in this room, if you're interested in transmedia, the chance to do the best thing you can do, which is really to start learning more about all of the different pieces that are involved, to start learning what it would take to work across divisions of people who don't usually work together, or disciplines that don't normally know how to talk to each other. So, I guess my best advice on some level would be if you're interested in working in transmedia, if you have time over the next two days, try to get to at least one of the video game sessions. Try to meet people there who you can talk to and understand how that part of the world or the, that part of the business works. Anyway, at the end of last year, uh, some of you may have heard about this, Lucasfilm kind of reached a major turning point. We got purchased by Disney. And uh, if you didn't catch that news, we actually got purchased by Disney for a little bit over $4 billion in US currency. That's, that's a fair amount of money. Um, and there's basically one reason for that. Disney does certain things better than anybody in the world. And when they looked at Star Wars, what they saw was a brand that could do a lot more than it was doing. So if you want to talk about people who understand how to create consistent experiences across all of these channels, across television, across film, across theme parks, across video games, Disney has kind of made their living off of that. And what I will say is that it's an amazing thing for people who love Star Wars. Dis the Disney purchase is going to be an incredible thing because a lot of things are going to start to happen to make Star Wars current again. When I got to the company, George was very clear with me and a lot of other people that there was never going to be another Star Wars movie. Now that Disney's purchased, there's going to be a new Star Wars movie in 2015, and at the moment, 
if everyone keeps paying for them, the plan is to do another new Star Wars movie every year after that. Forever. Just going to let that sink in for a second. So episode 7 is coming in 2015. Just about a month ago, the company announced a new animated series called Star Wars Rebels, which will take place kind of in the period of time that they've never talked about before, just before uh, the original movies started. And I absolutely guarantee you, there will be Star Wars areas in every Disney park within the next two years. Because, I mean, why wouldn't there be? It kind of, you know, maybe the most exciting thing about this, to go back to the, the metaphor that Jeff used this morning in his presentation of transmedia being kind of like a symphony and conducting an orchestra, is that there's actually a real effort being made at Lucasfilm for the first time to make sure that there's a conductor for that symphony. There's going to be a small core group of people who are responsible for figuring out all of those different stories and how the theme parks and the television and the video games and the movies and all of those pieces work together so that unlike last time, the company doesn't end up creating 800 different books and then saying, just kidding, none of that really happened. Now all of that said, it's an exciting time at Lucasfilm and I'm excited for the people who are going to be doing that but I'm not actually going to be one of them. And the last story I'll tell you is why, because I just changed to kind of a new role, actually. I was still at Lucasfilm when I agreed to come down uh, here and was lucky enough to be invited to be part of this event, and I'm doing something completely different now. Um, so I started this presentation talking about an article that I wrote about transmedia the day that I graduated college, uh, and how that sort of shaped the last 10 years of my career from then till now. So there's a second article that I wanted to talk about that I wrote in 2005. I don't generally write articles. That's not like a thing that I do. But when something is really interesting to me, then I usually like to try and figure out why and say something about it. And in 2005, I ended up being really interested in something that Apple was doing. Uh, this is probably a dumb question. How many people have iPhones or iPods or iPads? Interesting. OK, so I don't, I don't know if Apple's kind of content ecosystem is quite as strong down here as it is in other parts of the world. But I will say that the story that I wrote, the article that I wrote, was written the week that Apple started selling TV shows to go along with music and movies. And everybody who was writing about it was saying, oh, this is so cool. You'll be able to watch TV anywhere. You can watch it on your iPod. And I thought that was a really boring thing to conclude from it. Now, at that point, I hadn't yet been to the set of Veronica Mars, but I had talked to a lot of fans. And if you were a fan of Veronica Mars, then one of the things you lived with was always being afraid the show was going to get canceled. After the first season, everyone was afraid it was going to get canceled. After the second season, everyone was afraid it was going to get canceled. And there's this phenomenon that happens, uh, especially in the United States, at least, where fans get it into their heads that there are things they can do to convince network executives not to cancel TV shows that they love. So in the case of Veronica Mars, there were a few things they did. After the second season of the show, Fans sent thousands of Mars candy bars to the network executives. Thousands. Like, they filled up their office with them. And the year after that, they hired a plane to fly outside of the network executives' offices with a banner that said, Renew Veronica Mars. Now, for fans, that was a really big thing. They organized, they raised a lot of money, they tried to figure out how to make that happen. And I guess the, the thinking was, well, if these network executives just know how much we care, if they know that we really care about Veronica Mars or any other show, they won't cancel it, right? They, they wouldn't do that if they knew that it meant something to us. And unfortunately, that's entirely untrue. Veronica Mars got canceled the next year. Mostly what happens when people send candy bars or tins of sardines or anything else to a network is they get really annoyed because it fills up their office and it makes them look like bad guys. But it doesn't change the one thing that matters, which is the economics of the industry. If a TV show gets canceled, it's because it's not working with the old business model, which is we don't have enough people watching this show we can't make enough money on advertising. We have to find some other show instead. So without a massive audience, Veronica Mars got canceled after its third season, which was about a year after I wrote this article. And what I said in the article was that I, what I found most interesting about iTunes selling television was this idea that they had called the season pass, where instead of buying one episode of a show after it was already on TV, you could buy the entire season before it even started. And then every week when the new episode of the show happened, you would get that episode. That to me seemed really interesting, that they were for the first time telling people, you can pay for television that's not even available yet. So what seemed to me like common sense was, if fans were already willing to purchase shows that they liked ahead of time, why not take it a step farther and let fans decide what would actually get made? Why not take shows that people loved that were always in danger of getting canceled, like Fire... Is anyone a Firefly fan? Man, I gotta learn what TV shows are popular 
anywhere outside the United States. Um, you know, why not let people who like to rest development or Veronica Mars or Firefly, why not give them the chance to pay the money before canceling the show, and if you got enough money, that money would let them make the show and they could keep having it. So at the time, when I proposed that, I got a few responses from some of the studios, and most of them were along these lines. Basically, I was told in more and less polite answers, that's just not how it works. You don't understand this industry at all. That's never going to happen. So that was 2005. Eight years later, I've had the chance to go back in and talk to studios and say that it might actually be a reasonable idea. And so for those of you who, whether you've seen Veronica Mars or maybe if you've heard kind of what's happened with it over the last several months, um, what's worth knowing is that over the seven years since Veronica Mars got canceled, the fans never gave up on the show. Now, part of that was because the show ended with a lot of unanswered questions intentionally because they wanted to... Rob Thomas, the guy up there who created the show, wanted to make it hard for the show to get canceled, so he introduced all of these mysteries that he did not answer, and then the show got canceled anyway. Um, but over the last seven years, every time he's gone out and talked about anything, anytime Kristen Bell, who was in the show, has gone out and talked about anything, they always get the same question, which is, when are you going to make a movie to finish off Veronica Mars? And they've wanted to do that for seven years. They've gone back to Warner Brothers, who owns the rights to Veronica Mars, half a dozen times, and they've asked for the right to make a movie. They've said, we'll pay for it ourselves if we have to. And Warner Brothers said, nope, there's not enough audience. You can't, we canceled you for a reason. You can't make that movie. And so they, nothing happened because the studios believed the audience wasn't there for it. Now, over the past year or two, the idea of crowdfunding has started to get huge in a lot of different countries. Is it, I, I've been told that it's starting to catch on in Colombia, but isn't gigantic yet. Has anyone here used Kickstarter at all for anything? Okay, excellent. So, has, How many people have not even heard of Kickstarter? Okay, so for those 10 people, basically, really quickly, what Kickstarter is, is a site where if you have a great idea, you have an idea for a movie, and you need $200,000 or $2,000 to make it, you can ask people, you can tell them what movie you want to make, and you can say, if you'll give me this money, then I can make this movie. And so people have a chance to give money over a certain period of time, usually 30 days. And if you get all of the money you need before you run out of time, then you get the money. If you don't reach the amount of money you were looking for, you don't get any money and nobody pays you anything. So this has caught on more and more movies that have been winning awards, that have been winning Oscars, that have been winning at the festivals around the world. More and more of those movies have been starting to be funded by Kickstarter. They've been things that have happened outside of the traditional studio system. And so Warner Brothers finally last year made a deal with Rob Thomas and Kristen Bell about Veronica Mars. And they said, all right, fine. If you can get your fans to give $2 million to make a movie in 30 days, you can make the movie. And I shouldn't say this on record or on a live internet stream, but I will anyway. I'm pretty sure that was because they thought there was no chance fans would pay $2 million. You know, they, I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, they were pretty sure that it wouldn't happen and that would be the end of it, and they could actually say, of course we're not going to make the movie, even the fans don't want it that badly. So at that point, uh, given that this was basically what I had thought should happen nine years earlier, I got in touch with the showrunner, Rob Thomas, who I had met previously, and fortunately I was no longer a graduate student. I had worked at Lucasfilm and I had worked in advertising, and he had nothing to lose because he really wanted this to work, and I volunteered to leave Lucasfilm and help him try to make this happen. Um, because to me, this is an incredible turning point moment for fans pretty much all over the world and certainly in the, American, in the United States studio system. Because fans have never really had any power to change a studio's mind about something, not in any real way. And if this were to work, for the first time, fans would be able to say, no, we are willing to pay money to get what we want. So I figured that was a fairly important moment, whether it won or lost, and I offered to help and spent the next month working with them on raising that money. Now, the good news about all of this uh, is that we had 30 days to get $2 million. And it didn't take 30 days. It took 10 hours. At 24 hours, we were close to $3 million. At about a week, we were at like $3.5 million. And by the end of the 30 days, we were at $5.7 million. <laughs> Thanks. Which had been contributed by almost 92,000 people, which 
completely shattered the record on Kickstarter for the most number of people ever to support anything. Now, I've been talking way too long already, and there's another hour that I could fill just talking about what we did and how crowdfunding is starting to work and why it worked. That'll have to be some other time. What I will say is, since I've been trying to find like, a lesson that I can pass along from each chunk of my life, what is the lesson here? Since the campaign ended, since we finished raising money, we've gotten an insane number of emails from people who want us to give them advice on how they can raise money for their movie or help bring back their favorite TV show. We've had people beg us to bring back Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which we can't do. Um, but they generally, you know, the question is always, why were you guys actually successful? Why were you able to raise that amount of money? And so I wanted to share kind of one thing that I believe really strongly um, as a last lesson, which is that I think the word crowdfunding can be really distracting. Because I don't think crowdfunding is really about money at all. I think what crowdfunding is about is the power of having a really strong relationship between the people who make something that people love and the people who love it. I mean, in our case, the reason we got $2 million in the first 10 hours is because fans had been waiting seven years for the chance to do anything that would make a difference. This was pretty easy. All they had to do was give money that they would have spent to see the movie anyway. So it was fast. But you know, for, for us, I think for any project that really is going to do well with crowdfunding, it's not about saying, I have this idea, I really need your money. It's about figuring out why other people want you to do that thing and building relationships with the people who care about the same thing you do, who want you to do the thing that you're offering to do for them. And specifically for us, knowing that the fans of Veronica Mars for seven years had been trying to figure out some solution that would let them make a difference, to us the most important thing about the Veronica Mars campaign was actually giving people the chance to do something finally, to give them some sense that they were being empowered. And kind of as a last note, when Rob and Kristen decided they were going to go on Kickstarter, and when I started working with them, we had a really clear goal, actually. And it wasn't make as much money as possible, because once we hit $2 million, Warner Brothers was willing to contribute the rest of the money. They just wanted to know that there was enough interest to make it worth the effort it would take to make a movie. So for Rob and Kristen and for me, the goal was actually make sure the fans are a real part of what's happening. Don't just take the money and then give them a movie in a year. Create a new experience. Again, think about experience design as the most important thing, and give them something more for the money. Give them the chance to take part in something that matters to them. And so there are a million ways we're trying to do that now, because we have you know, at least six months at this point until the movie comes out. We shot it uh, over the course of June and July, and it's being edited now, and we're hoping to release it in January or February of next year. But throughout that process, we took... So, not counting anyone else, during, we shot the movie for 23 days. And during that 23 days, I took 12,000 photos of things that were happening on set. Our goal is to end up giving at least 2,000 of those photos over the next six months to the people who contributed to the movie and to explain pretty much every step and every decision that gets made without spoiling what happens in the movie so that they don't just think, oh, I gave money and you made a movie. The thing that actually has been most exciting to everybody involved in the project so far is the number of fans who refer to it not as your movie, but as our movie. So I'd love to say that wrapping all of that up, I have a really good final takeaway for you, but I don't. And I just got cued that I'm over time, so thank you for listening all day.